Today we are looking at a case from the mid 20th century. So sit back as we go to the USA. Theodore Conies was born on the 10th of November 1882 in Petersburg in Illinois, the son of Mr. Thomas H. Conies, a Canadian who had moved to the USA and had established himself as a proprietor of a hardware store where he worked with his wife Isabella. However, tragedy struck the family when Thomas passed away in 1888, leaving six-year-old Theodore and his mother to face the depths of their profound loss. Overwhelmed by grief and faced with the challenges of rebuilding their lives, Isabella made the courageous decision to leave Petersburg. Alongside her young son, she embarked on a journey that first took them to a farm near Beloit in Wisconsin, and then in 1907, to the bustling city of Denver in Colorado. Here Isabella found employment as a housekeeper at the Denver Democratic Club. She was a hard worker and did her best to provide for herself and her son. Theodore faced significant health challenges from a young age. While still a child, he had received a disheartening prognosis from doctors who cautioned him not to anticipate reaching his 18th birthday this dire prediction influenced his decision to forgo completing high school. Despite these health setbacks, he demonstrated resilience, opening an advertising business in 1910. Unfortunately, this business went bankrupt, but realizing that he needed to work, he found employment as a bookkeeper at the Denver Brass Works. It seemed that despite his poor health, Theodore approached the professional world with determination. However, despite his job, and recently acquired responsibilities. Fate took another cruel turn when his mother Isabella died in 1911, merely four years after their relocation to Denver. Theodore, now 23 years old, found himself navigating the complexities of life without the guidance and support of either of his parents. His illness as a child had left him weak and frail, and following his mother's death, he encountered personal struggles which ended up in him becoming unemployed and homeless. He was not only burdened with his physical frailty, but also with societal judgments, resentment built within him due to the treatment he received from others. A consequence of his delicate condition, he yearned for a space where he could escape the scrutiny of judgmental eyes and instead live a more solitary existence. Life had become very difficult for the young man. Although the 1920s in the United States marked a period of vibrant economic growth where industries flourished and innovations like the assembly line revolutionized production and provided employment opportunities. The decade also fostered a consumer-driven society and saw a surge in urbanization as people flocked to cities in pursuit of jobs and the promise of a more prosperous life. However, the euphoria of the 1920s was shattered by the onset of the Great Depression in the 1930s. Jobs became scarce and families struggled to make ends meet. Food lines and shanty towns became common sights as unemployment soared. Many Americans experienced financial ruin, losing their homes and savings. This period was particularly hard for Theodore. He was aware that in this time of economic hardship, he had seen individuals and families in close communities helping each other in order to get by, but he did not socialize very much and always kept to himself. In the autumn of 1941, a peculiar and grim tale unfolded in a quiet neighborhood of Denver. At the age of 59, Theodore again found himself facing desperate circumstances, leading him to an audacious act which would shock the community. He went to the home of a former acquaintance named Mr. Philip Peters, harboring the intention of seeking some much needed assistance. However, when he arrived at the residence, at 3335 West Moncrief Place, he discovered that Mr. Peters was not there. Wondering what to do, and by now in quite a bad way, he entered the unlocked property in the hope of securing something to eat and finding some money. He helped himself to food and decided to explore the premises to see if there was anything he may be able to steal. However, he somehow stumbled upon an unexpected discovery, a small trapdoor concealed within the closet ceiling Curiosity, or perhaps in a stroke of desperation, he opened it, and there, in front of him, was a narrow attic cubbyhole. 
Weary and disheartened by life's relentless challenges, he saw an opportunity to stay unnoticed and decided to make this confined space his temporary dwelling. He spent the next few weeks helping himself to food and drink each time he heard Mr. Peters vacate the premises. Mrs. Peters was in hospital at the time as she was recovering from a hip operation and Mr. Peters would go out every day to visit her. However, the situation took a grim turn on the 17th of October 1941 when Mr. Peters returned unexpectedly and saw a man who he believed to be a vagrant rifling through his call box. A confrontation ensued and armed with a cane, Mr. Peters tried to hit the intruder. However, the younger man fought back with an old pistol he had found in the house. And when this broke, he continued the assault with a heavy iron stove shaker. Eventually, Mr. Peters fell to the floor. Theodore looked at him and after a few minutes, realized that the 73 year old, who he had previously considered to be a friend, was dead. Strangely, rather than calling for assistance or vacating the house, he calmly returned to the attic cubby hole. Mr. Peter's lifeless body was discovered on the same day. A concerned neighbor named Miss Jenny Ross became concerned when Mr. Peters had not come to see her for dinner. Mrs. Ross had been preparing his breakfast and evening meal ever since his wife had been admitted to hospital. It was 6 p.m. and getting dark, so Mrs. Ross crossed the road to see what had happened to him. She became increasingly more worried as there were no lights turned on in the house. She knocked on the door but received no answer. A few people who lived nearby started to gather on the streets and a courageous neighbour named Doris Burke was lifted over the rear wall to investigate. She unlocked the door of the back porch and entered the house. She then opened the front door so Mrs Ross could come inside the property. As Mrs Ross turned on the lights, she screamed as a chilling scene unfolded before her eyes. A trail of blood meandered from the kitchen to the bedroom. She followed it with a mix of trepidation and dread before stumbling upon the lifeless figure of Mr. Peters lying on the bedroom floor. The police were called and officers dispatched to investigate. There was an eerie atmosphere and they found the situation quite mysterious. All entrances to the residence were securely locked and there was no evidence that anyone had broken into the property. However, a peculiar detail caught their attention. The trap door in the closet ceiling. They wondered if they should investigate this further, but then decided that there was no possibility that a person of average size could navigate through it. It was apparent that there had been a struggle. Blood was found in the kitchen, hallway, dining room and downstairs bedroom. Hand marks showed that the victim had valiantly tried to defend himself against the assailants. There was a walking stick next to the body and a broken gun was found in the kitchen. It was considered that an iron stove shaker was the weapon used, but after searching the whole house, they could find no signs of robbery. After a forensic examination and the removal of the body, officers secured the property before returning to the station with the conclusion that Mr. Peters had been murdered by a person or persons unknown. The police faced a formidable challenge in finding a motive for the murder. Described by neighbours as a kind and gentle man with no known enemies, the victim had peacefully inhabited the house for four decades alongside his wife. Despite delving into his past, the investigation yielded no substantial leads. Mr. Peters' journey through life seemed unremarkable. A 40-year tenure at the Denver and Rio Grande Western Rail Network commenced in 1891, where he steadily advanced until his retirement in 1930. The absence of any discernible conflicts or unusual incidents in his personal and professional history intensified the mystery surrounding the seemingly motiveless crime. Through this most terrible ordeal, Mrs. Helen Peters had been in St. Anthony's Hospital as she had broken her hip. When she returned to 3335 West Moncrief Place on the 1st of February 1942, she did not want to do so alone, so she employed a housekeeper named Mrs. Hattie Thompson. Despite the trauma of losing her husband, Mrs. Peters hoped to find some solace and resume a semblance of normality, but unbeknown to her, the home she had lived in for 40 years now became a backdrop for odd occurrences. Both women frequently heard mysterious sounds in the rooms. The growing unease led Mrs. Thompson to resign, convinced that the dwelling held an eerie ambience. 
which she thought was the ghost of Mr Peters. Following another fall in March, Mrs Peters was readmitted to the hospital, where she remained until the end of April, before finally returning home. Now left to contend with the unsettling atmosphere, she employed a second housekeeper, a lady named Mrs Edith Clark. However, she too soon resigned, frightened by the sound of footsteps and believing that she had seen a shadowy figure going out of a room. In May and July, Mrs Peters' son and daughter-in-law visited her, gradually convincing the 68-year-old to join them in Western Colorado. This move offered her a chance to try and forget the recent unsettling memories associated with her home. Living next door to the now unoccupied house was a lady named Mrs Mabel Burke and her five children. They were aware of the reasons as to why Mrs Peters' two housekeepers had resigned and knew that Mrs Peters had now left the property. But with the house next door locked up, they started to observe some peculiar activities. The flickering of lights was a regular occurrence, a curious and somewhat unnerving spectacle that evoked a sense of both fear and mystery. On one occasion, when the lights continued to go on and off, Mabel decided to see what was going on. So armed with a baseball bat, she knocked on the door in a faint hope of unravelling the mystery. Unsurprisingly, there was no answer. Life went on and Theodore continued to live undetected in the vacant house. Any reports of occupation were always dismissed as apparitions or the handiwork of local teenagers. Despite routine police checks on the property, it wasn't until the 30th of July 1942 that an unexpected turn of events unfolded. On one of the random police visits, an officer heard a sharp click of a lock on the second floor. He quickly ran up the stairs, where he saw a man disappearing through a trapdoor. The officer managed to grab his legs and pull him back down. Theodore Conies was then taken into police custody. He was hungry and thin. His clothes were tattered, his hair was long, and he weighed no more than a hundred pounds. While being interviewed, he sensed the inevitability of the truth surfacing, so he confessed to the murder of Mr. Philip Peters and described to officers how for months he had lived in the small attic room in the house. He said that he knew both Mr. Peters and his wife, and how many years earlier he had often been a guest in their house. He said that after a period of bad fortune, he left Denver in 1917 and started to wander from place to place. He ended up in Tonawanda in New York where he stayed for two years, but he eventually returned to Denver in April 1941. He told of how he had entered the house in the fall and decided that it was a good place to stay during the cold winter months in Colorado. He said he lived in the attic and at first would only come out when he heard Mr. Peters leave the property or if he heard him snoring at night. He added that he only ever took enough food so Mr. Peters would not realise that anything was missing. However, on one occasion, gripped with hunger, he found a plate of meat and started to eat it. So engrossed in his meal, he did not hear Mr. Peters return. He was in the kitchen and when he looked up, he saw the gentleman. He was caught off guard. A confrontation then unfolded, leading to a tragic outcome, the death of Mr. Peters. The story fascinated the press and following a remark from Detective Fred Zarno, who said that a man would have to be a spider to stand it long up there. The local newspapers dubbed Theodore Coney's the sneaky, sneaky Spider-Man of Denver. The surreal nature of this covert existence left an indelible mark on the community's imagination. Mrs. Peters confirmed to reporters that Mr. Conies had known her husband and had visited her house many years previously. She said that both were members of the Mandolin Club, an organization that often met at her home. Her son added that he had stayed in the house for three weeks following his father's death and when his mother eventually left the property and came to live with him, He'd arranged for a local cleaning firm to thoroughly clean the house and for a plumber to turn off the water. He said there was no heating, so the house would have been very cold. He also said that he did not believe that Mr. Conies could have foraged in the neighbourhood as there would have been tracks in the mud and snow leading to and from the house. Police Captain Childers, accompanied by Chief Deputy District Attorney David Rosner and Detectives Fred Zarno and John Toll, took Theodore back to the property at 3335 West Moncrief Place 
and although he seemed to be quite agitated, to be back at the house where he had lived in the small attic room for nine months. He did manage to produce an 8,000 word statement, in which he told of how a fight started in the kitchen, progressed to the front door, and ended up in the bedroom, the result of which was the death of Mr. Peters. After a formal trial, in which Mr. Conies pleaded guilty, he was convicted of murder and was sentenced to life in prison. With the courtroom proceedings finalised, Theodore's incarceration marked the conclusion of a perplexing story that had captivated not only Colorado, but the whole of the United States. He was then sent to the Colorado State Penitentiary in Canyon City. However, the echoes of his covert presence persisted, casting a lingering shadow over the once tranquil community. While justice had been served, the memory of the enigmatic figure who lurked behind closed doors resonated as a stark reminder of the vulnerability that can exist within the seemingly secure walls of a home. The neighbourhood, now faced with the task of rebuilding a sense of security and normality, slowly started to distance themselves from the peculiar and disconcerting events that had unfolded within their midst. Theodore Conies passed away on the 16th of May 1967 at the Colorado State Penitentiary Prison Hospital and was laid to rest at the Mountain Vale Cemetery in Canyon City. He was 84 years old. Hello everyone and thank you so much for listening. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have and I hope to see you all again in the next brief case 